Hello, and welcome to the Drug Discovery World podcast. My name is Giles, and I'm here to take you through another topical and insightful article from Drug Discovery World. Today's episode is an article from our spring 2014 issue, titled, Collaboration for Innovation is the New Mantra for the Pharmaceutical Industry. The article was written by Professor Jackie Hunter, CBE. With over 25 years' experience in the pharmaceutical industry, Professor Hunter is currently CEO of Benevolent Bio, formerly Stratified Medical Limited, which is the bioscience arm of Benevolent AI. Benevolent Bio applies Benevolent AI's technology to drug discovery and development, and provides the company with the insight it needs to significantly improve the pharmaceutical R&D process. At the time this article was written, Professor Hunter was Chief Executive of the Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council in the UK. In order to maintain a flow of innovative medicines, there is a growing realisation that companies cannot allow the status quo to remain as it is, and the need to identify sources of appropriate knowledge and expertise outside of their own organisations is paramount. This article discusses some of the challenges in arranging collaborative arrangements with each other and academia. Much has been talked about the crisis in new drug development and the lack of productivity in the pharmaceutical industry. However, the crisis is also true for the biotechnology firms, which the large pharmaceutical companies have come to rely on as a source of pipeline sustainability. This has prompted an examination of all aspects of the biomedical research and development, R&D, process in recent years to try and cut costs and improve efficiency and productivity. Although this has led to mergers, reorganisations and tens of thousands of job losses in the industry, so far it does not seem to have created the radical shift required. If a radically different model is needed for companies to survive and thrive, what might it look like? Some authors have proposed abandoning the current system of patented medicines altogether, and introducing the funding of pharmaceutical R&D through taxation or prize-based funding systems. Another approach that has been adopted by other industries to solve similar problems in terms of lack of productivity and innovation is to build strategies around pre-competitive collaboration and open innovation. Many large pharmaceutical companies are now espousing the virtue of these approaches, but will they work if adopted inconsistently by the industry and not adopted or supported by academia and research funders? Pre-competitive research has been recently defined by Janik Woodcock as science participated in collaboratively by those who ordinarily are commercial competitors. Open innovation, on the other hand, although defined in many different ways, is basically the proactive use of a company's intellectual property, IP, and resources to create new innovations and generate new products and accompanying IP. It promotes both external and internal sources of innovation and thrives in an environment where ideas are spun in and out of a company in a very dynamic way. To create this environment needs strong senior management support, as it requires a culture very different from the more controlling, hierarchical R&D culture that still existed in many companies at the turn of the century. By definition, It also requires much more proactive management of, and communication about, a company's unused IP. Many companies have begun to explore what this means in a pharmaceutical context, but it is clear that such a radical new approach will require more time, effort, and resources. However, the benefits of adopting these different ways of collaborating could be extensive in both tangible and intangible ways, reducing cost of failure through predictive biomarkers, leveraging of unused IP, and external funding mechanisms, access to networks of talent and innovation, and increased trust and transparency with patients and other stakeholders. These benefits will be realised not only for the pharmaceutical companies, but also for academics and other collaborators. Internal innovation One way of experimenting with these new concepts is to trial relevant tools and technologies internally to drive cultural change within a company before going external. It is always a challenge for large organisations to be able to harness the knowledge of their employees and bring people together to share insights and information, breaking down barriers and challenging silo mentalities. The advent of computing platforms such as Microsoft's SharePoint 
have facilitated data sharing and exchange, and pharmaceutical companies would do well to emulate companies from other sectors, such as Arup, which has developed excellent systems for accessing knowledge across an organisation. Companies such as Lilly and Pfizer have put in place internal systems for seeking solutions to problems across their organisations, and these have demonstrated the power of this approach. However, many companies struggle when reorganisations occur to retain the links and knowledge that has been built internally. Robust systems need to be put in place to maintain this knowledge base, but these are also important for optimising and managing links between the internal and external environment. Companies such as Procter & Gamble have an excellent track record in doing this, and their approach may also be applicable to large pharmaceutical companies. Why should companies collaborate with each other and academia? At first sight, it seems counterintuitive that companies would want to share data and potentially give away competitive advantage. However, this assumes two things. Firstly, that the possession of such data does indeed give a competitive advantage. And second, that such a closed operating model is financially sustainable. The drugs that do make it to market have to fund the cost of failure of those compounds that did not make it. As a recent Morgan Stanley report pointed out, the current success rates of the pharmaceutical industry are not sufficient to sustain large internal R&D organisations, and the current operating model is not financially viable. Thus, it is essential that companies either improve success rates or decrease the cost of failure. The two major causes of compound failure are lack of efficacy in man and unexpected toxicity either in animals or man. Therefore, it is not surprising that the major areas of collaboration have been in the development of tools and technologies for target validation and the discovery and validation of biomarkers for efficacy and toxicity. Many large public-private consortia have been formed, for example the Innovative Medicines Initiative, IMI, and the Serious Adverse Events Consortium. But there is a need to coordinate and integrate these multiple efforts within companies so that the maximum possible benefits are obtained. In the future, the effective pharmaceutical companies will find themselves as hubs at the centre of a network of collaborators and suppliers, focusing internally on their core competencies, which might include medicinal chemistry, clinical trial execution and sales and marketing. They will facilitate interactions across their network to stimulate the development of innovation ecosystems. The opportunities that this will bring to expand beyond traditional products and markets will enable pharmaceutical companies to evolve into companies that offer a range of healthcare solutions. These will include not only prescription medicines, but also diagnostics, branded generics, and technologies that support personalised medicine, as well as potentially nutraceuticals, and other wellness options. Although the internal size of many R&D organisations will inevitably decrease, the complexities of managing and maximising the impact of this external web of relationships will demand new skills and capabilities over and above those of excellent science. Developing and rewarding employees who possess such skills will be an additional challenge. One important question is what is the optimal size of internal R&D activities given this new environment? There is certainly a critical mass of expertise required to both attract new collaborators and be sufficiently knowledgeable to identify and interrogate new opportunities. Furthermore, those companies that excel in the development of these new collaborative models will have a significant competitive advantage in being able to work across sectors to deliver more innovative healthcare solutions. So what current collaborative models are being explored by pharmaceutical companies, and how successful have they been? Collaborations based on sharing of expertise and resource. One of the companies that has used resource sharing as a way of driving their open innovation strategy is Lilly. In 2009, Lilly launched PD2, a portal which allowed scientists to have their compounds screened against phenotypic, disease-relevant assays that were already established within Lilly. In addition, for interesting compounds, relevant secondary assays can also be made available to provide additional biological characterization. Lilly provides all the data free of charge and with no obligation to the investigator, and the investigator retains the IP rights to the chemical entity tested. 
Within a couple of years, it had allowed Lilly to create a network of 70 small biotechnology companies and 174 academic institutions. Data presented by Lilly showed that the compounds submitted were structurally diverse from the Lilly compound collection, and a reasonable percentage had biological activity in one or more assays. The initiative has already led to the establishment of new collaborations with academia. In 2011, Lilly also introduced the Target D2 initiative. In this program, Lilly will give external access to a panel of well-validated target-based assays across five targets of interest. Importantly, they say that they will also provide access to relevant computational methods to let investigators carry out structure-based research on the initial results. Therefore, this model of sharing appears to be delivering value for Lilly. Another example of resource sharing is where collaborators can access expertise and know-how. GlaxoSmithKline, GSK, has established a group called the Skinovo. This group sits within the R&D organization of GSK, with access to GSK experts across the whole R&D continuum. The terms under which this advice is provided are flexible and allow GSK to build strong links with collaborative partners. The unit has been operating for several years and has strong links with Stevenage Bioscience Catalyst, the established open innovation campus adjacent to GSK's UK Pharma R&D site. A more tangible example of resource sharing by GSK is the Open Innovation Labs at Tres Cantos in Spain. Here, the focus is on neglected diseases and the labs are run by a non-profit foundation. Investigators from around the world can come and work in the labs and gain access to GSK's expertise, processes, facilities and infrastructure, including an ultra-high throughput screening facility and biosafety level 3 in vitro and in vivo laboratories. GSK has put £10 million to date into the organisation, and other funders have also provided financial support. There are three disease areas that have been prioritised, and investigators have to undertake research projects that are in line with the Foundation's mission. It'll be interesting to see if there are any insights from this open innovation activity that could be more widely applied in other areas of drug discovery and development. Takeda has announced that it is providing incubation facilities for academics and biotech companies in its Shonen Research Centre in Japan, where external investigators will be able to work side by side with Takeda investigators. UCB has also announced that it will make some of the new mammalian cell culture biopilot plant available to potential partners together with some in-house expertise. These examples show how companies are seeking to leverage their in-house expertise and resources to expand their collaborative networks. These companies will evaluate the success of the resource sharing efforts in terms of access to new partners and technologies. Companies are also engaging more strategically in large networks of academic collaborators. For example, in 2010, Pfizer announced plans to establish Centers for Therapeutic Innovation, CTIs, which had the remit to build open innovation partnerships with academic medical centers globally. The academic partners would have access to antibody tools and technologies and to work alongside Pfizer staff in dedicated laboratories. To date, Pfizer has established 20 collaborations with major academic medical centers in the USA and has four dedicated CTI labs in Boston, New York, San Francisco, and San Diego. They've received more than 300 research proposals, and from these, 20 projects were selected for support. Although the academic retains the right to patent and ownership of the patent, Pfizer has the first right to license any clinical probes that arise from the collaboration. Although, if they decline to license, the academics are free to progress the probe themselves or via further partnerships. If Pfizer really is making resources and tools available in this way, rather than solely providing cash, then this does represent a change in the collaborative model between pharma R&D and academia, which hopefully will accelerate progress. In 2013, the Karolinska Institute and AstraZeneca established a joint venture called the Karolinska Institute AstraZeneca Integrated Cardiometabolic Centre. This centre will conduct both clinical and preclinical studies for AstraZeneca's two biotech units 
AstraZeneca Innovative Medicines, and Medimmune. In the centre, scientists from the company will work side by side with those from academia, and they will be able to access all the facilities of the university. The cost to AstraZeneca is up to $20 million per year. Some resource sharing collaborations have already been established for a while. For example, GSK announced in 2008 a five-year, $25 million collaboration with the Harvard Stem Cell Institute in Boston, where participants would spend time in each other's laboratories and resources, as well as cash be made available to Harvard by GSK. Unfortunately, internal research priorities change within GSK, and many of the key personnel and areas of research involved in establishing the collaboration changed. Whether this led to a reduction of the benefits for both parties is unknown, although it must have had some impact. Indeed, feedback from academia groups involved in such collaborations suggests that industry participants can change rather frequently, and when they do this, it can have major changes on the dynamics of the collaboration, as well as affecting the deliverables. Using compounds to drive collaboration while Pfizer is clearly making its antibody tools and technologies available, including their phage libraries, as part of the CTIs, other companies have made their chemical compound collections available to biotechnology companies and academic collaborators for preclinical screening. For example, Merck Serono is providing a mini library comprising former Merck Serono development or research compounds and derivatives, free of charge to investigators, for use in their assay systems. ISI has established a strategic collaboration with the John Hopkins Brain Science Institute, JHBSI. In this collaboration, researchers at JHBSI build assays against neuroscience targets of agreed interest. These are then transferred to ISI for high-throughput screening. JHBSI may then carry out further hit-to-lead work with milestone payments for successful projects. Previously. JHBSI had signed a deal with Biogen IDEC, which included research support for proposals chosen on a competitive basis by a joint Biogen IDEC BSI steering committee. The agreement was it streamlined intellectual property and reduced regulatory barriers. The first two awards were announced in 2007, and a third project award was announced in 2009. Target research areas included multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, and pain. AstraZeneca has worked with the MRC to give access to 22 clinical and preclinical compounds to UK-based researchers. Although only brief details of the compounds are available on the MRC website, more details will be given under confidentiality if a proposal is of interest. Companies are also starting to provide a selection of their compounds directly to academic organisations. AstraZeneca has added 250,000 high-quality compounds to the Lead Discovery Centre based in Germany, LDC, to enhance its compound collection. The LDC will then identify compounds from the combined collection that show activity against the portfolio of targets. These will be selected by the LDC from its range of academic partner institutions, which includes members of the Max Planck Society, Germany's leading basic research organisation. AstraZeneca will have a preferred right to obtain a license for preclinical and clinical development and commercialization, with terms agreed individually for each project. Although in the previous examples, the pharmaceutical companies still retain rights and some controls on the use of their compounds via joint steering committees, making compounds available can be a powerful force for driving collaboration. There are also examples of companies sharing compounds with each other, such as AstraZeneca and Bayer, allowing companies to greatly expand the range of compounds they can screen their targets against. However, this only makes sense when there is little redundancy between the collections, as was the case with AstraZeneca and Bayer. In 2013, the Innovative Medicines Initiative launched a project called the European Lead Factory. The aim is to build a joint European compound library which can be accessed by both private and publicly funded institutions. It has 30 public and private partners, including seven pharmaceutical companies, and will establish a European screening centre. It is hoped that this will act as a catalyst for further drug discovery in Europe. Pre-competitive activities 
The European lead factory is an unusual form of collaborative activity, as it involves compound generation and sharing. Most pre-competitive activities have been focused on areas that are traditionally seen as being safer areas for collaboration. For example, biomarker identification and validation, preclinical safety and toxicology, method development, and the design and validation of patient-reported outcomes. Such activities certainly form the bulk of pre-competitive collaboration today. Some would even call this non-competitive rather than pre-competitive. However, the boundaries for such collaborations do not appear to be shifting. Within the umbrella of the IMI, for example, the new meds project in schizophrenia has pulled data from clinical trials, and this data has enabled a better and shorter trial design, thus saving time and costs. Data from genetic studies has also been pulled to allow correlations of genotype with phenotype, which will be important for target validation. To date, more than 4,500 researchers are involved in IMI projects from private and public organisations, including SMEs and patient groups. This in itself is a considerable achievement, and the advent of projects such as the European Lead Factory will continue to expand the impact on the whole R&D continuum. IMI is already providing a valuable template for public-private partnerships in biomedical science, and learnings from the consortia will be important to incorporate in future initiatives. The rise of crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing approaches have been used internally by a number of companies such as Roche and Pfizer. Roche Diagnostics actually compared the effectiveness of internal and external crowdsourcing using the same problem. Internally, they took six problems out to more than 2,400 people. Although less than 20% of those contacted actually engaged with it, they received nearly 50 proposals, one of which was truly exciting. They then took one of the six problems externally, working with Innocentive, an open innovation intermediary. Within 60 days, they had 113 detailed proposals with a solution to a problem the company had been wrestling with for 15 years. Other companies have also used this approach. Pfizer's Nucentis business unit posted a recent challenge on the nature slash inoscentive open innovation platform. They were looking for novel means of measuring the interaction between a drug and its targeted ion channel. Although they were looking for a solution which would be applicable across all ion channels, they would also consider proposals specific to voltage-gated channels. Obviously, this is also a good way to allow Neocentis to identify potential collaboration partners. GSK has canvassed for new therapeutic concepts as well. Ideas are submitted to a panel of judges, and 10 from Europe and 10 from the USA will be selected to win a collaboration with GSK. The winners will then work with GSK scientists to advance their ideas, for example, by screening against the GSK compound library. Experience with the use of these types of challenges, both within and without the pharmaceutical industry, has shown that the more specific the question, the more likely a good response will be forthcoming. Poorly articulated or very broad challenges frequently do not produce good solutions, but it is not clear what is required. Other companies are using the web for soliciting collaborative proposals, although the way the collaborations are executed seems to be along traditional lines in most cases, i.e. The company solely provides money rather than expertise or other in-kind contributions. Academia is also using crowd science to progress drug discovery projects. For example, the India-based consortium Open Source Drug Discovery. The Medicines for Malaria Venture, MMV, and the EBI have created resources and easy-to-use data repositories for groups working on malaria to speed up the drug discovery process. Preliminary data suggests that an open-source, crowd-based approach can certainly increase efficiency and reduce costs to milestones. The best practices and lessons learned from these endeavours will be valuable if made public, and certainly the MMV is beginning to do this. The MMV has six key laws to abide by for these open-source projects. First law. All data are open and all ideas are shared. Second law. Anyone can take part at any level of the project. Third law, there will be no patents. 
Fourth law. Suggestions are the best form of criticism. Fifth law. Public discussion is much more valuable than private email. Sixth law. The project is bigger than and is not owned by any given laboratory. Clearly, these laws are not applicable for pre-competitive collaborations or other forms of open innovation. But other lessons learned from the MMV studies may be applicable. For example, ways of tracking contributions, the optimum use of collaborative tools and management methods. Conclusions The boundaries for collaboration between companies and academia are being expanded and new models are being explored. For example, it is becoming possible to develop collaborations around compounds and other IP-sensitive areas in ways that would have been unthinkable a decade ago. There is still some way to go. Many companies close down areas of research and terminate compounds for a particular indication, but do not spin out these assets or make the associated reagents available. The reasons for this are many, but the main one is that companies have a fear of success, that the assets will make a lot of money and therefore a lot of attention is required to ensure that no crown jewels are given away too cheaply. However, as stated at the beginning of this podcast, most compounds do not make it. The IMI and other public-private collaborations are beginning to build trust and understanding between the various stakeholders, as well as delivering some real tangible benefits. However, there are still challenges. Lack of standardization in terms of data collection, storage, and annotation will hamper data sharing and collaboration. But again, some steps are being taken to address this. For example, the formation of Transcelerate Biopharma as a non-for-profit organization to address standards in a range of areas, including clinical trials. Likewise, the Pistoia Alliance is trying to do the same in the preclinical arena. Another issue is logistics, including everything from how to best track compounds and contributions to who should be the medical sponsor for collaborative clinical trials. Transcelerate Biopharma will address some of the issues, but this is much wider than clinical trials and the acquisition of clinical data. A further issue is assessing the value in the short term of collaboration. The R&D process is a long one, and it will be important for the IMI and other large-scale collaborations to devise short to mid-term metrics, or key performance indicators, to show how valuable they can be. The final challenge lies in aligning internal and external objectives. In many companies, employee bonuses and promotions, for example, are more dependent on internal objectives rather than externally focused ones. Certainly, there are some new models of interaction, for example, the IMI, but whether these are really producing a radical change in the way companies do the business of R&D and how academics interact with the industry is still very much open to debate. This article was written by Professor Jackie Hunter, CBE, who is currently CEO of Benevolent Bio, the bioscience arm of Benevolent AI. At the time this article was written, Professor Hunter was Chief Executive of the Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council in the UK. If you've enjoyed this episode and want more from Drug Discovery World, then you can subscribe to the journal and get the latest issues delivered to you via post or electronically, completely free. Just head to ddw-online.com and you can subscribe there, as well as read further articles and view PDFs of part articles, including this one, in our PDF archive. If you've enjoyed the podcast and found it useful, then please leave us a review, as we'd love to get your feedback. Thanks for listening, and we hope to see you in our next episode.